Okay. So I want to welcome everyone to this webinar and uh, we're uh, called the uh, Blessings and Curses of Assimilation. We'll explain that title a little bit further. My name is Ted Gong. I'm the Executive Director of the 1882 Foundation and along with uh, Gary Solo with the uh, American Jewish Archives. Uh, we're going to present uh, this seminar or this discussion and I'm so happy to have you here together. We'll explain further about what we're going to be doing. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge right away some of the uh, people that made this possible. And uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge support of the Chinese American Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, we also had support from Asian American uh, uh, Organization of Asian American, OCA, o Organization of Asian Americans uh, of the D.C. chapter. And we also have uh, uh, we also have Panda Express who is helping to sponsor this particular program. Uh, so uh, before going any further, uh, I want to point out that this is a webinar that is going to is going to be recorded. Uh, so uh, later on, there's also going to be a question and answer segment in which we can ask you, uh, you can express your ideas and thoughts. Uh, try also throughout the time, uh, you can use the chat function and you can also use the uh, question and answer function and Wei and I and uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the program and I would encourage you to have exchanges among yourselves as well as with us and I'll try to introduce those topics into the uh, those questions and comments into the discussion. Uh, there, as I said, at the end there will be a question and answer segment for the audience. You can raise your hand and ask your questions directly. Be aware that we are recording it. So if you don't want to be recorded, then make sure your mic is off and your image is off. Uh, I want to introduce Gary Sola. He's a great, he's a great scholar, a good friend, and this is our third year of doing this type of programming. And uh, and I want him to say a few words on behalf of the American Jewish Archives. Well, Ted, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everybody, uh, all 100, it looks like almost people who've joined us so far. We are so grateful to have uh, everyone with us, and especially this uh, uh, wonderful panel. Uh, I, I want to be begin by echoing what Ted just said. Uh, if everybody knows this month is uh, Jewish American Heritage Month. We're on our very last day. It's also Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And over the last three years, uh, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, which we don't need to go into today, but for they're all good reasons, uh, we've been seeing a lot of partnering between the Asian American community and the Jewish American community. And I think that's a terrific thing. And I wanna uh, echo what Ted has just said uh, I'm so grateful for this partnership and the friendship that, uh, that has uh, arisen from it. So uh, uh, as, as the ancient sages used to say, Ted, uh, in, in, in the holy language, uh, which in, in English means, uh, let this continue to fructify. Uh, we will continue to uh, do this in the years ahead uh, and, and uh, so forth. Uh, uh, before we actually begin, um, I know that all of us recognize that one element, just one and not the only one, one element that has brought us together is the uh, very upsetting and challenging issues that have uh, faced uh, both the Asian American community and the Jewish American community in the last five, six years intensively. And that is, of course, uh, acts of bigotry and prejudice that have befallen our community. And that reminds us that before we even begin, our American society, our American civilization, and I'm probably being uh, under speaking here, is, is, is experiencing an illness, a sickness. And part of that sickness has been uh, expressed in the kind of violence and senseless murder that has taken place in the last 10 days. And so we want as a community, before we begin, we want to uh, pause each uh, person uh, in his, her, their own way. We want to uh, take a few minutes, uh, actually a minute uh, of, of silence in remembrance 
of the victims of callous, senseless, brutal bigotry in Buffalo uh, 10, 12 days ago. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, more recently, the unspeakable, uh, dastardly, uh, 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 awful uh, violence that was perpetrated on young school children in Uvalde, Texas and their teachers. So before we enter into a discussion uh, relating to American society and life, let's all take a minute in remembrance and also if I might in hope and prayer that uh, discussions like this can be some kind of antidote for this malady that has befallen our community. Thank you so much, Ted. I put it, put the ball back in the in, in your capable hands. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you so much. You know, the topic we're dealing with today uh, is uh, something with Jews and Chinese have dealt with for decades and not centuries. How do we maintain our uh, own identities and still uh, assimilate within the various uh, uh, countries or peoples in which we have lived? And it's especially interesting to find out for us to discuss how have we done, what kind of strategies have we as uh, Jews and as Chinese uh, adopted? How successful has we been? How unsuccessful we've been? And we look at the American, American society particularly, you know, we have done so much. So from the time for the Chinese, from the time that we were 1882, totally excluded from coming to the United States because of the American law that prevented Chinese from coming because they were totally unsuitable to become Americans, unadaptable. We have now become the model minority, right? And how far have the Jews come in terms of their place and successes in economy and politics and so forth? And yet we constantly are continuously looking at things like flare-ups and anti-Semitic actions and we constantly, uh, as we have seen in the most recent months and the year or so, this rise in anti-Asian hate. Now, one of the things we, we've gotten there, we've assembled a group of the most uh, really bright people. <laughs> I'm really proud to be part of this group that's going to be discussing these topics. I don't know if we have any answers, but I hope that what we can do in this discussion, which I hope is going to be more of a conversation, and hope that you guys can also be involved in the exchanging ideas for us in the comment and chat session as well as the question and answer period. We've assembled uh, several, um, several, I would call leading thinkers or practitioners of the, the questions. And I wanna start first with introducing um, each person to make a few minutes, a uh, couple of minutes uh, to explain who they are and then also what the type of work they're doing right now. Starting with Ting Yi, who is our director at the 1882 Foundation, our educational programs. And Ting Yi, can you say a little bit about your most recent work? Thank you, Ted. Uh, yes, I'm uh, first of all, very happy to be here um, and to talk about this topic. I come at this uh, as a teacher and as a high school administrator and how we can teach about assimilating and becoming a part of a, a greater uh, American uh, nationality and all of that and all that that means. So a lot of my focus uh, in recent time has been how to try to bring about that kind of uh, awareness in schools and through our work with teachers and with students. I come at it particularly because of uh, I think the word assimilation and its kind of partner in all this, the melting pot, um, I find are not particularly useful terms anymore in how we speak about uh, the American immigration process or how people become a part of America. So that's part of what we'll be looking at. Um, Ibram Kendi, who many of you know as in the context of how to be an anti-racist, has raised the, the question of assimilation as a, a term that is inherently hierarchical. In other words, people who are trying to assimilate into something, uh, the people who they are assimilating to see them as something 
that is not quite what they want them to be. And therefore people who are assimilating into that uh, have to adapt and have to change. So that's, I think one issue that we kind of have to look at as we're going through this. Another thing that I'm uh, speaking with a group um, last week uh, or a couple of weeks ago with Echoes and Reflections, which is a Holocaust educational group and also made up of uh, mainly the audience was teachers. How do we begin to look at how we frame that? Because the terms assimilation and melting pot are still very much a part of the standards and the uh, structure of how we are supposed to teach uh, about this. But I opened that session with looking at a quote from Viet Tan Nguyen, who's a professor out at UCLA, um, who had, a, a, I think, a pretty provocative quote, which goes like this, what it means to love my country, no matter how it feels about me. And what I take from that quote is the effort on the part of people who are becoming a part of America often work very, very hard to try to make that adaptation, to assimilate, if you will, into that culture. And yet many, many of the things that they try to do aren't successful in that sense, which is why we see the bigotry and the anti-Semitism. One of the um, things too, just before that presentation uh, was in fact the shootings in Buffalo. Um, and again, the, if, if any group has had trouble assimilating into American life, it's African-Americans. So it's a, a kind of a term that even though you may have been here since the very beginnings, it's not something that is easy to do. So that's where uh, I'm starting from, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of this discussion. Thank you so much. You know, uh, one of the most uh, great opportunities to meet great new people, <laughs> Dr. Reeve Ellen Prayer is somebody who is, uh, I'm so uh, honored to have her join us. And she teaches at University University of Mich Minnesota. I was going to say Michigan, but the <laughs> University of Minnesota. And I'd like to introduce a few words of the type of books you've written, which really are addresses those issues that we're talking about. Thank you. And I'm so grateful to be included in a conversation that's that's cross-cultural in, in that sense. So uh, the work that I've done, um, I, I've always defined in terms of the term acculturation acculturation suggesting that one's culture can stay alive within the context of the larger society as against assimilation, which in the case of, of American or European Jews really meant the erasure of difference. But behind acculturation for both the Chinese experience and the Jewish experience was always fragile from Chinese exclusion laws, to in the 1880s when Jews began to come to the United States or the, the Eastern European group that came to 1924 when legislation uh, outlawed Jews, not so much as Jews, but as people coming from Eastern Europe. And so it was then that Italian and Jews were largely excluded. So we know both this country opening to both of our groups for reasons of labor that were desirable and then being shut down because of racial hierarchies that have had different consequences for Chinese Americans and American Jews, but to some extent have shaped our time here. My actual interest has always been in particular in gender mm -hmm. and specifically around women and also social class mm -hmm. to attune us to the fact that assimilation or specifically acculturation is never done in general, but around a number of identities and gender being a very important one. And in fact, that gender both in Chinese American life and American Jewish life has been a way in which the dominant culture has turned men and women against each other um, out of various kinds of anxieties. And that, that is part of the work that has really shaped my, my life as a scholar, our current experiences, especially for Chinese Americans and this hatred of Asians that we, Asian Americans that we are all experiencing simply reveals again and again, the uncertainty with which any of us are part of this society, falling differently around race than it has around uh, Jewish Americans, but the deep, deep um, white nationalism and Christian nationalism that operates operates against Jews as well in a way we haven't seen for a while. So we are in a very complicated time as, as the rest of you have noted. 
Yes, thank you so much. Welcome. And I want to welcome Dr. Franklin S. Odo, a long-term mentor of mine, probably one of my oldest uh, uh, cohorts, is certainly on the 1882 Foundation. Uh, but and even if it's far back as the 1960s, when we're looking at Asian American literature and that kind of stuff like that. But anyway, uh, Dr. Odo or Franklin is uh, uh, formerly uh, a great scholar in a lot of books and various things uh, related to Japanese history as well as the Asian American history. And he was the first director of the Asian Pacific American program over at Smithsonian, gone through a couple of iterations now over at Amherst. And if uh, Franklin could maybe say a few words of introduction about your most recent work, that will be great. Happy to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be in this company. <clears throat> so um, where do I start? I, you know, I grew up in, in Hawaii, which has always been sort of an outlier among the states. <clears throat> Still is, I think. Um, but those of us who were, and Hawaii is the only state in the union that has never been majority white. Uh, so that's been, been an interesting experience because most of us growing up, uh, what we, we called ourselves local, but it meant people of color, pretty much. And we, we were not stupid. Uh, we understood that uh, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, that white people actually Haole, we called them, Haole in Native Hawaiian, <clears throat> actually ran the place uh, politically, economically, socially, journalistically, um, uh, in terms of public health and so on. So um, for those of us who were, I, I think there were two avenues. One was uh, a, a kind of assimilation that was formed and formatted by the fact that there were so many of us. So in my public school education, uh, we hardly encountered white people. And, and so they were kind of a distant group that we knew of as being a dominant force. We were listening to the radio, watching television, uh, reading the newspapers. So we didn't, we were, we were aware of the social stratification, but, <clears throat> For many of us, you, you could get by without abandoning uh, many of your traditional uh, cultural patterns and heritages. Um, but there was an, sort of a, an unseen hand guiding the disintegration of uh, people's choices about who they were and what they chose to be. And, and then there were a few of us um, of particularly of East Asian, Asian American extraction, Chinese and Japanese in, in Hawaii, <clears throat> who either were very smart and were going the traditional academic route, or like myself, had some street smarts, who grew up with um, a, a way of, uh, <clears throat> because we were not in, in areas of power and our parents were not, our communities were not, were <clears throat> forced to uh, assess uh, where we were and look at the context. And so one, one of the things that I learned was to try to read people uh, fairly quickly and got very, quite good at it. So, so um, I bullshitted my way into uh, Princeton, for example, although I was not a great student, I was okay. But I, but I understood about um, being in extracurricular activities. So I played sports, I was a uh, on the baseball team, I played football for a couple of years. Although that was mostly to attract women um, because of the uniform, <laughs> but I but I knew how the game was sort of played. And I later on, I can I want to talk about the the fallacy of uh, apparent success that that eventually some of those values that come along with um, an apparent uh, achievement in acculturation or assimilation or be becoming white adjacent um, are, are really misleading and um, harmful to uh, human development in particular, in, in, in particular in my case. And I wanna, wanna see if, I, if that um, exploration resonates with uh, a 
other people as well. So let me stop there. You know, I want to welcome all three of these wonderful panelists. And I want to return back to Dr. Gary Zola. And he went and when we were talking about this program, he suggested that we read this article, or actually, it's a uh, it's a commencement exercise uh, speech, which is actually uh, pretty timely considering where we are in the school schedule, right? And so the idea is the it's it, it, the article is called "Blessing of Assimilation in Jewish History," and we were talking about it and says, you know, it could also be a curse. And that's some of the things that we want to explore. And I'd like to have Gary maybe talk a little bit more about this article. And then from there, I hope that all of us, the three panelists and all you guys in the chat and the question and answer can sort of pepper us with various questions as, uh, as we, we move, move along. Uh, Gary? Thank you, Ted. Uh, you know, uh, when we were just, as Ted was saying, we were discussing this, uh, immediately this article came into mind and I want to talk about it in a second. Uh, when I when I mentioned it to uh, Dr. Prell, uh, I didn't even have to finish the title and she already knew the article I was talking about because it's one of those articles that, uh, uh, you know, sort of becomes a part of the canon in the academic world that ever it, 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 uh, it is so well known that uh, so many people want to read it, especially relating to the American Jewish experience. And uh, uh, basically what it posits is, and, and I wanna point out uh, something, and here's where we have perhaps, perhaps some differences between the, uh, uh, the experience of Asian and the Pacific Asian community, where there's a, a whole array of different religious traditions that comprise the Asian community. Uh, Jews may argue about what is best for its religious tradition, but we all uh, subscribe to what we call Judaism. And, uh, you know, there's this idea in Judaism and in, in the religion that the further back you go, the, 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 the closer you get to Mount Sinai, the more true you have uh, in terms of uh, uh, what is really important and that the more you progress and you get further away from that important magical moment, uh, the less accurate you are in terms of what really happened. And that of course runs against uh, the scientific idea of progressivism, which is that the more we learn and the more knowledge we gain about the world, uh, the, uh, the more we know and the more progress we make in terms of humankind. It's, it's diametrically opposed. So uh, the, the author of this article, Dr. Gerson Cohen of Blessed Memory was a very distinguished historian and he actually rose to become the president of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And he gave this commencement address and he, with the fetching title, The Blessings of Assimilation. <laughs> And basically he, he points out the following. He, he says that if we're going to speak scientifically and historically, then you just have to observe and just take note of the fact that the Jewish experience in every single way has acculturated and uh, I'm borrowing uh, the word that Dr. Prell used, uh, 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 assimilated to some degree in every chapter of its history, wherever it was, and that there is no such thing as an unadulterated Judaism, if I use that word meaning that a Judaism that was created on Mount Sinai and has continued on uh, without any change or any uh, uh, modification up till the present time, that that's a myth, it doesn't happen, and that we have always been impacted by the culture. And the important point that he makes, in, 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 well, of many, is that this is, this is a blessing because the purpose of acculturation, by and large, was not to see to it that we disappear into the larger culture, but rather the purpose was to make 
the historic experience relevant to each and every period of time. And that was a good thing because that gave it life and renewed it every generation. Now, I'm gonna conclude with this uh, sort of uh, 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 laying it out uh, because I, I wanna focus on the American Jewish experience since uh, I, that's my area of interest in particular. And I, I wanna talk about two scholars who sort of focused on this issue. Uh, one is Professor Jonathan Sarna and the other is Professor uh, Sylvia Barak Fishman, both of whom uh, teach or taught at Brandeis University. And they both posit the same concept. Uh, they call it, uh, they have different terminology, but it's basically the same concept. They argue uh, that in America, uh, uh, the, the way that Jews have uh, actualized uh, and, and made real what Dr. Cohen observed as the blessings of assimilation are that we have basically made the case that if something is truly American, purely American, connected to the great ideals of American, I, the American uh, uh, founders, then it's Jewish. And if something is Jewish, meaning comes from our Jewish tradition, then, then it is without question American. And Dr. Sarna refers to this as the cult of synthesis, meaning by the word cult, that it means it's, it's, it's almost a religious conviction that if you are a good Jew, there is nothing about being a good Jew that prevents you from being a good American. And if you're a good American, there's nothing about being a good American that in, inhibits you from being uh, uh, connected to your Jewish heritage, that there's nothing mutually exclusive. Uh, Dr. Uh, Barack Fishman, I think, refers to it as coalescence. The, uh, uh, but there, it's the same thing. It's the idea that there, there cannot be any difference. And when we're confronted with the, uh, what we would call being hit in the face with uh, those uh, contradictions. When it doesn't work out, I think when we were talking, Ted, I used the example of uh, what happens when school opens on the new year, the Jewish new year, or on the day of atonement, or what happens when the high holy days fall on, uh, on the a World Series championship or whatever, that, then suddenly, how can you do both? How can you be attending synagogue and being a part of the American uh, if you will, secular religion. Uh, well, then when those things happen, we have to resolve them and we find ways to resolve them. I'll end with a very important quote from Dr. Cohen's article, because I think it's a good way to introduce the topic to the rest of the speakers and let them comment on it. He says, and I'm quoting from this uh, very famous article, he says, assimilation, properly channeled and exploited can become a blessing. The great ages of Jewish creativity were born out of a response to the challenge of assimilation. Mm -hmm. And there is no reason why our age should not respond to this challenge with equal vigor. But then he says, assimilation is not a one-way street. And he says, therefore, he goes on to say that that means that uh, it, it has to be uh, properly uh, 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 channeled uh, so that it, 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 is, it, it remains a, a fundamentally a blessing and not a curse. I'll stop there. And I'd love to hear what others have to say uh, either on uh, on that topic or uh, you know what, what I was sort of talking about or, 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 or re cognate uh, related uh, issues. Okay, how's that? Mm, sounds good. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm gonna sing it out somebody while everybody else is thinking about the responses. Thinking, you know, this idea that there is, uh, 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 if it's Jewish, it's American. If it's American, it's Jewish. 
And we, we often are looking at the idea of what distinguishes us as Asian or Chinese American or Chinese versus American. And we're always constantly battling that, that question. Part of it is also important for us to understand how do we survive? And that's another question we wanna look at too, is these ideas of, we assume that assimilation is always the good thing, that's the objective, but maybe it's not. There may be other things involved as well. Um, so, uh, thank you, Gary, first for uh, laying out, I think uh, um, a number of the large ideas that are, are part of Cohen's uh, commencement speech. Um, I identify with that a lot because I think I mean, more or less by age, uh, you know, I, I could have been almost in that audience <laughs> listening to that speech at the time. And so you have to take a little bit of a grain of salt, I think, with in terms of, you know, the um, uh, maybe a little bit of a dated quality of, of it. And then certainly some of the language maybe that, that's used, particularly in, in use of the term assimilation itself. Um, so I found that kind of just interesting as I was reading it and projecting back uh, to my own uh, you know, life. And I think uh, there was the sense of assimilation and something that I went through is Franklin was talking also about how one tries to lead one's life as being part of uh, a group that is accepted. I think uh, one major takeaway that I have uh, from this, and this is more, I think, to your question or your point, Ted, that you just raised here, is there's something that he referred to as healthy and unhealthy assimilation. Um, and I think that's really an important concept because from uh, an immigrant's point of view uh, or someone who is on the outside trying to feel uh, a way to fit in, there is this sense of um, survival, of how do you make yourself acceptable and how do you make yourself um, really a part of this? And it's, it's part of a survival instinct. So there's that healthy side where you take on those trappings of the dominant culture and you try to uh, you know, become what it is. And you don't even necessarily do this consciously. Franklin was talking about uh, sports. And that's a way, of course, of very much uh, finding a way in if you're participating and in, in involving yourself with that. And you know, Gary also mentioned uh, things like the World Series conflict. One of my uh, big memories as a child is, why is Sandy Koufax not pitching for the Dodgers you know, in this you know, particular game uh, when the World Series is opening? What, you know? Uh, he had to honor his holy days. So, uh, and he wasn't necessarily even all that um, a devout and practicing Jew, but he, you know, it was important enough for him to make sure that other people understood that. I think one key difference for looking at the Chinese experience uh, and the Asian American experience is that one aspect of where you get to be a part of the country is through citizenship. And the Exclusion Acts, 1882, that denied Chinese the right to become citizens. Well, how can you participate? How can you be a civic participant in the very kind of life of the country when you can't even become a citizen, you can't vote? So I think that's maybe a key uh, factor to look at when we're looking at the differences. So that becomes an important part of it. And also uh, Chinese from the very language that was used by legislators when the exclusion acts were created, talked about them uh, Chinese being unassimilable. They just couldn't be a part of it. They didn't have the right language. They ate crazy food. They, you know, they didn't behave in correct ways. They wore this hair in a long queue that didn't make any sense to Americans if you really wanted to become part of the country, even though there were good reasons for why that might have to happen. So I think that's one um, uh, idea that I really would like to take away is there are good ways uh, of uh, having this healthy, uh, assimilation and also unhealthy ones that also, um, uh, I think Dr. Prell was talking ab about uh, ones that, uh, an aspect where you're, uh, there's an aspect of your identity that's erased. And uh, Cohen also spoke about that. If there's something where your identity gets obliterated in the process, that obviously is not a healthy assimilation. So yeah. there is that balance that we started off in talking about. How do we take what is uh, important about becoming American versus those things where you are really in danger of losing your identity? Yeah, and in the case of Chinese and some of the Asians and other people, it's not only a matter of losing your identity, it's a matter of losing your life, right? So uh, 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 Dr. Prowl, can you, would you like to add uh, to the conversation going forward? I see you nodding a couple of times on, 
on uh, things which Tingy mentioned? Well, as Gary Zola will tell you, not all scholars agree. No big surprise there. So I would say that one of the great privileges of coming of age as a baby boomer in, in the 60s was uh, the opportunity to rethink the nature of America uh -huh. that was definitely created in, in my lifetime in the first foundational way through the civil rights movement. But of course it was there before that in the labor movement and a variety of other places. And the civil rights movement, as I'm sure many of our participants know, became an extraordinary model for many forms of what we call identity-based activism. But of course we came of age in identity. It was the model of a white Protestant um, ideal, male as the leader to a dramatic rethinking of American history and American culture that first revealed the impossibility of assimilation for virtually anyone who was not white and Protestant, and at the same time, a rethinking of the nation. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to a thinker like W.E.B. Du Bois or generation after generation of immigrants, they loved and believed in the American ideal that they saw the dominant culture constantly corrupting and undermining. And I do think, um, I appreciate the work of my colleagues, professors Fishman and Sarna, who really held out for this kind of idea. But as American Jewish history came of age in this period of time, we know there was constant resistance against assimilation or even different ideas of acculturation, which is to say that groups have always been complex. There have always been resistors. There have always been people who wanted to rethink how to negotiate and how to call America to account mm -hmm. for its failures as in so many ways, a supremacist society for which Chinese exclusion and the denial of citizenship was absolutely at the core of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that we have a tremendous heritage from those of us who were not part of the dominant culture. Maybe our parents, others fought to be in it. Maybe those of us who were viewed as white were able from the beginning to hold some strength in it, but to have come of age, not just as an individual, but as a scholar or to be trained in that period where we rethought the complexity of American culture, we came to understand the, um, the falseness of assimilation. And there's a lot to be said about Gerson Cohn. It's a very touching article. He actually was speaking at a graduation for Hebrew teachers. Um, he so passionately believed in that possibility of a more dynamic understanding of Jewishness, but it was a long time ago. Um, and um, a lot has happened since then. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, assimilation, if it's meant to be like what we used to think about in terms of uh, uh, what do we call ourselves, the melting pot, and you had to change yourself into a essentially a white American or something this certain the time that we grew up like Franklin and I it really was part of the civil rights and the assertion of your own identity which was almost anti-assimilation was to assert your own worth your own value and Franklin I know you have this activist element in your background and maybe you could speak to a little bit about what Reeve, uh, Reeve Allen is talking about and how that fits today in some of the the ideas that we've thought about how do you maintain yourself yeah. as your and and all the traditions that are there but still claim and define our place in america i'll try i think this is this is a complex issue that requires a lot more time but let me start by saying um i started out by talking about um assimilation as a uh, a dangerous um path for individuals and I would just point out that the, the, the single most um, group in American society today are prone, are vulnerable to suicide ideation is Asian American young women. Is that right? Yeah. And, and it's a problem for high school and college age uh, kids. Uh, and it has, uh, and, a, and it's a lethal um, 
image that is uh, being um, contested in a, a number of psychological journals and mental health issues. But it related to that, I think, is the fact that many of these kids who are thinking of self-harm as a way out of this dilemma, of this dilemma called life, um, uh, are, are children of immigrant parents who have extraordinary expectations of their kids. And <clears throat> uh, so I've been looking fairly carefully at the Harvard affirmative action case, which, which all of us know uh, comes before the Supreme Court this fall. And all expectations are that the, this, this conservative court will rule against the consideration of race at all in admissions policies in elite um, public and private institutions. And so in that light, um, where, where the, and they're mostly Chinese immigrant parents, by the way, who are <clears throat> in the uh, group that is, uh, that comprises the, the plaintiff group uh, in the Harvard case. This, uh, um, so looking at that carefully uh, reminds me of the model minority myth. So I've been teaching uh, a class at Amherst College for the last two years uh, called um, the model minority myth, Asian and, and Jewish Americans. And my uh, colleague, Wendy Bergoffin, does uh, Jewish American studies, is married to a Japanese American um, scholar colleague of mine. And I'm married to a Jewish American woman, um, have been for <laughs> longer than I want to reveal anyway over over half a decade and and um so what I, what I wanted to say is that some of the what we found uh is that the the quality that what makes the model minority myth that applied to Jews particularly in the 20s when the whole um the, the whole sort of panoply of values was designed by Harvard to begin with to, to um, minimize the number of Jews who would be admitted to Harvard and other Ivies uh, followed that path. And that was to do geographical distribution because a lot of Jews came from New York City. So, so geographical distribution helped uh, that cause um, extracurricular activities, leadership, um, sports, all of that stuff is relatively, well, it's a hundred years old now. And, and now we're gonna to have to rethink some of this if we wanna think about what kind of society we really wanna live in, because this is clearly aimed at black and brown um, populations. So for the, for the um, Chinese immigrant parents, uh, sometimes I've had to personally intervene with their kids to help protect them in terms of what they wanted to study uh, that was not in line with the parents' ex expectations of assimilating into American society, being, becoming a doctor or a lawyer or engineer or IT professional. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm taking so long. I, wa I wanted to just say some of the same qualities that are, that are promulgated uh, and 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 um, uh, proffered as as elements of success by uh, minorities that are that have become models like Jews and Asians uh, include things like hard work or work ethic uh, or deferral of gratification uh, or commitment to homeland values, but in in times when uh, it's convenient for uh, white supremacist groups to, to turn on us uh, hard work and, and uh, uh, a work ethic become slavish, uh, uh, cheap labor, uh, um, labor that threatens uh, real jobs for real Americans, uh, deferral of gratification becomes uh, slavish devotion to uh, community uh, actions that um, sim simply are 
in human conditions of living on a grain of rice a day or something, you know, these kinds of uh, qualities that uh, allow for uh, denigration of uh, cultural values or values that were in good times attributed to groups as, as, as positive are very easily turned, the double-edged swords that, that are easily turned into weapons and weaponized against us uh, so, when, when it's convenient. Yeah. So that's the question, you know, uh, you know, Gary and others that, uh, you know, we have, we being uh, all of us in the diaspora have done things to make ourselves successful. Like I said, the great switch from the time when we were Chinese were noted to be totally unassimilable. And now we've become the model minority for other people. And the Jews have been so successful in so many areas, right? Uh, politically, commercially, et cetera. And there's also a wider nuance of uh, populations in the society. But as soon as something, what is it that then persists in this American narrative or other countries that are looking at, uh, at, at uh, us as something that is, can, can be attacked? Uh, despite all that have done in, in terms of our quote unquote assimilation or to taking on different ways and, and, and actually showing success, why then are we constantly being, there's constantly this anti-Semitic move and there's constantly this uh, anti-Asian activities going on. What, what is that? Is it something inherently in white nationalism or, <laughs> or white people that just sort of like, hate us and looking for an excuse to hate us something like that how do we and then how do we deal with that we teach um, as Tingy does he's constantly teaching in the classrooms about how to look at these things and we're always talking about how do we build coalitions to address these issues and in the end something flares up and it's the china flu and they should get out of the country or there should be something else or there's an attack on a synagogue for whatever reason we don't know Well, uh, I, 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 I think in, in, in I'd first like if, if she is willing to, I'd like to defer to Rivellen because I know she's given a lot of thought to this as written about in, in, in related to this uh, question. So, uh, you know, uh, 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 am I putting you on the spot? If I am, I don't mean to. No, not. I mean, I'm happy to answer, but obviously, I'm not o the only person on the screen who, who has a um, a perspective on this. And this is a tremendously complicated issue because uh, we can talk about the undercurrents in this society that do not go away, but we know that there are political realities and historic moments that make these come to fruition. So, um, you know, I mean, Hannah Arendt, whose work on the origins of totalitarianism talks about uh, a dynamic of, of deep loneliness for people who are disconnected from communities, from, uh, from a, a sense of, of connection to others, of meaningful work, of a variety of things. And as people have pointed out, this is so much more true because of media. And we know that the digital world has made available to people who may be occupying these kinds of, of experiences that can easily teach them about the great, uh, the great replacement theory or the importance of whiteness or uh, all alien groups that are here. I mean, there are people who look at economic explanations because of deindustrialization and parts of the country uh, that, that uh, thanks to globalization economically have left people very isolated. I mean, there are economic explanations, there are other kinds of explanations, but I think it's, it's, it's maybe worth saying in this context that while some of these are very much transnational, you can find them in Europe, they, you can find them in the United States. The United States is based on ideas of a racially superior group and that anyone outside of that group and Jews have sometimes been seen to some extent as a racial grouping in the United States, people outside that group threaten the dominant culture in some sense. And so for whatever reason, 
you can draw on that. W.E.B. Du Bois, to go back to him, used a phrase to talk about the wages of whiteness. When you have nothing else going for you as a laborer, your whiteness makes you different than those around you. Mm -hmm. So these are long standing yeah. in the very foundations of this country, uh, which begins with slavery and despoiling indigenous people that can flare up in various times. And there are groups that were underground after World War II, then they explode back up. But there's no question that we are looking at transnational ideas, but ideas that are very meaningful in this country. Why now? Well, we know we have never been more polarized and we know we had a form of leadership that called it the China disease, who, who has unloosened the tongues of people who are making use of this. And we know that this is a terrifying moment in terms of the attack on democracy and on the illegitimacy of those people who cannot be counted within some kind of groups who imagine themselves as white and under attack, no matter how inaccurate they are. So to say that this is a two minute explanation that is absurdly simplified, at least it you know provides some conversation to invite the other panelists into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I can pick up on, uh, I think two, um, words really that uh, Rivan Allen just uh, used. One is the threat. When it becomes perceived as a threat uh, from a particular group, whatever it may be, then you suddenly see things turn. And it, then also it triggers the survival uh, aspect of the group that is now being under attack. So there's this kind of reaction to the perceived threat uh, that a group might uh, have. So whether it's you know, uh, African-Americans and they're uh, striving for freedom in the civil rights movement, or even as recently as the George Floyd type of thing that galvanized people, you see this reaction on, on the part of uh, white Americans that suddenly says, oh, th there's something wrong with this country. Who are these people? What makes them the way they are? And that becomes a challenge for us to really be able to look at our own history, our own experiences, and see how we can somehow turn that around. And it also goes to uh, Cohen's point in, in the uh, article that he mentions um, that when there are, I think, crises like these, uh, and you're forced to re-examine your uh, position within the society, it is also though an opportunity. This is a time perhaps for being able to think creatively, think of different ways of how you look at your own identity. I think this has been very true of, say, the Asian American community in the last year, as it has come under attack in many ways that it had not seen in, in a long time. So there is a, uh, an attempt by individuals to really pull together. Um, I think Gary used a, a, a phrase uh, way back when we were talking about this in the first place, oppression of the United, uh, so that it, it's when you're feeling that you're being oppressed as a group that you somehow find a way to galvanize yourselves into speaking out and finding a way to reimagine how this world might work. I think Dr. Odo, you wanted to, you had your hand up and uh, please. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I thought that was an affirmation of um, Ravelin's statement, but but I, oh. <laughs> but I did um, um, yes, this is a very interesting kind of question, um, <clears throat> and I'm I'm wondering what, what what we haven't discussed yet, which might be a little bit more. Um, off target or, or too extreme for, for this particular panel. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I'm thinking back to what, what is it that I was trying to assimilate into? Mm. I mean, what, what yes, uh, <clears throat> the original, I, I guess the original uh, goal was to be as close as possible to a WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. That's changed some. So, um, Jack Kennedy, the first John in the White House, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. So Catholics are probably uh, okay 
today. Uh, uh, Southern Eastern Europeans are okay today, except for Jews. Uh, so Ukrainians in particular are, as refugees are welcome, uh, but not um, uh, people from Sub-Saharan Africa or south of the border, immediate border. So we, so there may be, it may be that there is an absolute limit, a red line, so to speak, for white supremacists that cuts, cuts us off uh, with people of color, may, maybe even uh, LGBTQ, I'm not sure about that, because uh, there's so many LGBTQ people among um, white supremacists. So who knows, the, the line is maybe a little flexible still. I have trouble imagining, given our history, that Asian Americans are going to actually become part of the new, a group that is welcome like Italians or Poles uh, who were so um, uh, demonized back in the earlier 19th century and later 19th century, because they were, they were part of the group that was um, marginalized in terms of uh, quotas in the 1924 act that Rev. Allen referred to. So um, if that's the case, then those of us Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders who are, who are trying to assimilate into that particular select group that has, yes, expanded its borders or its parameters, um, but may have met um, the limits of its willingness to expand its uh, borders. Hmm. If that society, if that group uh, is willing to ex expand the in inclusivity to all of the rest of us, then we're thinking about an America that uh, we may all uh, envision. Uh, but if not, then um, we have a problem for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then we have, then we have to think about uh, different kinds of strategies for resolving that problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Including how we as people who are demonized and marginalized at this point, strategize in terms of what it is that we're trying to acculturate or assimilate into. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we might look at this, uh, here's a little contribution on my part, and I know we want to get to some questions now, but just one last thought is, uh, I think it was Dr. King, uh, among probably many others, who pointed out that, you know, the founders, the uh, male founders of the nation who conceived of the great and noble documents, uh, that their rhetoric uh, was almost cosmic in, in its nature. You know, all are created equal, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and yet, uh, at, at, this, at, at this very moment, as they were creating these ideas that the, the, the that which uh, it became actualized was, was as uh, uh, Riv Ellen pointed out, uh, born in, in, uh, in uh, 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 this uh, sort of, it, what was minted into this was racism and uh, white superiority and, and, and male dominance and, and, and on and on. So the, the, for me, uh, as I really sort of analyze the, the, the history of the American Jew, when we're faced <clears throat> with that kind of ugliness, uh, it seems there's an instinct to fight for the rhetoric, for the nobility of the ideas. Uh, it, 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 in other words, to actualize that which uh, uh, the words which, or, or the idea that they, they gave birth to, as opposed to what they in fact was minted into the uh, uh, the society itself, uh, whether that's uh, doable or not, uh, is uh, is a different question. But uh, but if it's not doable, then I think what Dr. Odo has just said is something we all need to take seriously, which is we may need to uh, uh, think about an entirely different strategy. Because as I read the past, and it's just me personally. Uh, th that's whenever confronted with that kind of bigotry, 
the Jew has turned to the Constitution and to the Declaration of Independence and, mm. and has argued uh, about the ideas of America. And, that, that, and, and if we could actualize the ideas, then the, the issues we're talking about would evaporate. But whether or not that can happen because impressed into the literal birth channel of it was this, uh, these issues that uh, Dr. Uh, Prell pointed out, it, it, it makes it a very uh, complicated issue. I, I, I know we want to get to uh, yeah. questions, but I don't want to just uh, 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 speak uh, ex cathedra if somebody wants to add on to that. Yeah, we should, uh, you know, um, yes. I, I just want to make one quick, uh, quick response, which is, um, as minority groups, we are not all the same. So it was certainly very compelling that the Harvard case had Chinese American families on both sides. Um, some very much, uh, well, they were on both sides. And it is the case that there are Jewish Americans who stand for certain political ideas and support certain political figures and uh, love Tucker Carlson. And that is still so shocking to me and makes me so happy my parents are not alive <laughs> to have seen this because this would have been unimaginable because you had this sense that Jews had a certain consensus exactly of the kind that Gary Zola is, is articulating. And it's important for us to know that um, we may find alliances across on shared agreement that will make us different than other members of our own group. And so that members of our group may see the same forms of racism that horrify us. And they just say, well, that's not about us. And especially for groups that have, as both of Chinese Americans and, and Jewish Americans, who have achieved certain kinds of economic registers and all of that, it, it, it ju I just think it's useful for us to, to make sure that we don't communicate to anyone or to ourselves. You know, we all think the same within our groups. Wouldn't it be nice if it worked that way? Because I agree that racism and anti-Semitism can create great solidarity but it doesn't work as well in my view as that used to. And maybe that is because of economic differences or all kinds of complicated issues, but that doesn't mean that, that we can't find alliances yeah. with those of us who want to make these struggles together. So yeah. I'll, I'll end there, I'm yeah. sorry. No, I, just... I, no I, I think uh, raising a number of questions, a lot of things, for example, we talk about assimilation the question what are we assimilating to <laughs> it's changing why what is the compelling reason to assimilate we always say that it's supposed to be a, a positive thing to assimilate maybe that term is not right some of our guests are saying things should we be talking about a culturing or adapting and as opposed to assimilation to be the same as those other people but how do we adjust so that we are working together certainly the things that i think uh, i know frank is interested in and we, we uh, uh, Dr. Prell is interested, that coalition building is an, also another issue. It's, it's an idea that if you want political action, you have to figure out how do you, how do you uh, build coalitions to get things done, right? And so there will always be conflict. And I, for one, hope that we continue to have differences because how boring it would be <laughs> if everybody agreed to everything <laughs> that everybody said. So, you know, you know Dr. Cohen made uh, a comment I, I kind of, Put in my mind where he said that uh, uh, the thing that in, in terms of assimilation, in terms of that, first of all, he, he said, What do you do if you're a Jew and we could all say Chinese? That we say, Okay, you have to maintain your identity, and then the reaction to changes or the assaults on your community are going to be you're either going to falsify, become tradition bound. Or you're going to have to figure out a way to adapt or accommodate those forces that are around you to do things. If the forces are such that they're white nationalists, you don't necessarily want to join with them. But you also have to figure out a way to work and survive in that area, that adapt things. You have, and he, I think part of the things he says is that if I read it right, and and Gary, everyone else will tell me that Ted, you're way off base. But the idea is that you know if you. If we assume that maintaining our Jewish identity or maintaining our Chinese identity expressed in our traditions 
are so important for us. And so therefore I'm gonna emphasize and reinforce all my traditions. Then, then maybe that's one strategy to take. Or in the case he talks about maintaining language, you don't, you don't, in a sense, don't talk the other guy's language. You just uh, reinforce your own sense of community through language. But he makes the point that uh, uh, that the uh, Jewish culture and tradition is actually strengthened by the fact that you have adapted to uh, to say either Greek or Greek or to English or something of this sort because it allows you to express and continue to traditions beyond that one group that you emerged from in that one decade. So you can actually talk about Jewish tradition or Chinese tradition in a much uh, uh, adaptable, uh, stronger way. In a way, it maintains the relevance. And I like that use of the term, maintains the relevance of the tradition to today's questions. And that provides something for our future generation to build upon. Uh, so what I'd like to do is if any of those things stimulate some discussion of the speakers and now the audience is putting up some questions, uh, various things that you guys uh, can maybe take up. Uh, uh, I'll tell you, Ted, one question that I, I, I think we, it, you know, we may not be able to get into it in a serious way, but it, it, it's important because one or two people have raised the issue that, well, uh, you know, if, if you're wearing your minority status on your physical being, so your skin is black or you have features that are obviously noticeable uh, or or your um, or you're wearing what we might call uh, identifiable Jewish garb so that you know you you it, 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 even if your face uh, may be white you're you're communicating to the outer world uh, a, a precisely who you are uh, that is a kind of, I'm now trying to paraphrase what one of the, uh, 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 the a couple of the questioners, that's a kind of challenge that uh, someone who looks like Gary Zola is not necessarily facing because uh, I could be and have been often mistaken for an Irishman. So, uh, 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 and, and uh, so, uh, Yet I think, uh, uh, but maybe not. Uh, uh, Riv Allen pointed out that I think I heard this that you know uh, uh, that 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 is uh, we we're now in the Jewish community we're we're sort of facing a racial uh, you know a racial kind of bigotry uh, despite all of that, which is often hard for. Uh, the African American or uh, the Asian to f to appreciate or to understand, because you know if if we have white faces and we you know you can't identify us as Jews uh, just by looking at us, how can you say you're experiencing any kind of racial? Uh, this of course came to a head with Whoopi Goldberg's right incident where she mentioned this on TV and. Uh, we're living at a time where maybe uh, talking about the differences of time, maybe uh, 40 years ago, we would have accepted that. And yet now it seems more and more that we're, that, that uh, racialism and, uh, and racist behavior can even befall uh, uh, people who, uh, who uh, uh, don't necessarily have that kind of immediate recognition. Uh, that's, uh, but but there were several questions about that, and maybe others of you want to speak to that because I think it's in, it's something that's raised a lot in, in terms of uh, Jews as a minority versus uh, others. Mm -hmm. I have a, a thought to add uh, along that line. One of the questions is: Can you think of strategies that really worked before the majority evolved, quote, on their own terms? Um, and I, I think there's a way of kind of looking at the kinds of progress that uh, people of color minorities have made over the years where it's, it's a lot of three steps forward, two steps back, not just a step back. And I think we're in one of those moments right now where we see a, a lot of the, the bigotry that has uh, come forward. Um, but I think 
there are uh, elements where you can see uh, how different ethnicities, different groups have had a profound impact on the culture of the majority society. You think of food, you think of dance, you think of all, particularly in, in the arts. Um, and uh, this is where we see uh, an evolving change in the overall population towards those minority groups. Uh, speaking to, to Gary's point, uh, I've often been mistaken, I'm half Chinese, half Dutch, but uh, growing up in New York, uh, I was often um, presumed to be maybe Puerto Rican or a, a Jew. So there were these things where in my own in life, particularly in the community where I was growing up, that uh, my identity was, was somewhat uh, unfixed <laughs> and not really you know, seen in the way that it was. And I'm thinking too, that in uh, another way of maybe looking at uh, acculturation versus adaptation versus assimilation is the flip side of that, which we are you know, calling cultural appropriation, where one group, mainly whites are taking and borrowing what they see from other groups and quote, making it their own. Uh, so it does work in this other way. And it forces uh, groups within uh, minority groups um, to reappraise their own uh, contributions, if you will. And is it all right for white Americans to take on those aspects of your traditions? Uh, I was taken, um, and I just kind of rewatched uh, some of this the other day, but there is a documentary uh, produced a few years back called in S The Search for General So about General So's chicken and mm -hmm. how that is a staple of every single Chinese restaurant around the country. And it is a homogenizing influence in the sense of the United States. You get a variety of General So's chicken that's unique to New Orleans, another one that's maybe to San Francisco, another one in New York, but all Americans kind of embrace this. So this is kind of a, a weird uh, maybe transition of how some of these things you know, work. Uh, but going back to a point that I was trying to make for and Ravel and also was making here, there is something where people can be comfortable with that and accepting of it to a point. And then all of a sudden something happens and now it is perceived as a threat. And everybody kind of goes back to their survival mode and how is it that we can really come and make a, a difference that moves the country forward, upholds those values in the constitution and the declaration of independence that we're all supposed to be bound by. So we're coming to the 615 mark and we're gonna start closing down. So I just like to maybe uh, ask each of you to make some final remarks or comments. And I wonder, one question I saw in here is, are we uh, Jews and uh, Jews, Amer Jewish Americans, Chinese Americans, Stronger is our tradition the one that helps identify us, that identifies and we subscribe to. Are we stronger because of the challenges that we've had to face to deal with all these uh, anti Semitic and anti Asian hate issues? That how has that helped us define ourselves and whether it's a stronger or 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 better form? Uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe Gary, I'm gonna. Well, I'm going to save you for last because you're part of the co-sponsoring. <laughs> so that means, uh, Reva Allen, can you maybe, you don't have to answer that, but talk about that, but we're at the final final comments and closing comment section. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I, uh, I, I, I think the issue of the experience of oppression can articulate itself in many ways. Mm -hmm. It can create a sense of understanding of others. It can uh, build alliances, it can open that possibility. Um, and that has a long tradition, uh, very much among secular Jews, among Gary's denomination, Reform Judaism, and the incredible role of, of the rabbinate around the civil rights movement. I mean, it can really build connections. Mm -hmm. It can also, make people angry, mean-spirited, believe that their group is the only one who suffers and not find a way to alliance. So, so it's, it's, it's hard to generalize. I think it's very important to hold up um, what, what being an object of hatred can do, um, especially in the context of the United States to call the nation to a different kind of setting. What I what I do see certainly at, at in university life, particularly for Asian 
American and Pacific is, is very strong senses of connection within and across groups that often did not feel that sense of connection. That's really been the case for me to see over the years that I taught. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think to in any way not suggest that we are in a moment where democracy is under attack, where white supremacy is, it's not the majority view, it's only, honestly, white Christian nationalism defines more than 20% of the Republican party. So I, I think what I would say is we have no time to lose. Yes. We need to acknowledge this, we need to understand it. We need to find points of connection to support one another. And, and I have daughters in their late 30s and early 40s. I have grandchildren. I'm worried about the future of the nation. And I feel honored to have been in this conversation to, to, to really share this with you and those who are with us tonight. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Tingyi, uh, final word from you, uh, closing remarks. Yeah. yeah. There's a question here right at the end uh, that someone's posed. What do you think the situation will be in one or two generations <laughs> where more and more people will be biracial or multiracial? And it ties really to uh, something that I thought of a, of a closing here that also fits in very well with this notion of building connections and a vision that we have for the future. And as a teacher, this is what we're all about, right? We're, we're looking towards the future and the children are our hope for the future. And in one of these presentations that I have given before, there's a, a letter that was written um, by Isaac Landman. He was the editor of the Hebrew Weekly. It was written way back in 1924. And that of course was the year that the uh, very, very strong, uh, basically limiting immigration quota laws were put in that so restricted uh, Jewish immigration and of course continued the uh, uh, exclusion of um, Asians into the country. But he was addressing this uh, letter uh, from uh, Isaac Lamb, and he was addressing this letter to W.E.B. Du Bois. And he wrote, we have chosen you among a few other progressive men and women to give us your conception of the state of America in which our children's children, meaning 2020, will live. We can conceive of no theme which so fires the imagination as this attempt to discover the future. Mm -hmm. Well, if Very we project strong. ourselves now, uh, roughly 100 years now into the future. I think that gets at the question. Uh, I think it was Betty, was her name, who posed the question here. Yeah. What is it that we hope for? What is the vision? Uh, yeah. And as a teacher too, looking at this, it's to me uh, a wonderful assessment to give to kids, to have them project in their view now, what they see the country looking like 100 yeah. years from now or 80 years from now. Yeah, and, and they can learn from, there. yeah, and learn from all these discussions and the fact that we're continuing this discussion after the 14th Amendment 150 years ago. That, uh, Franklin, uh, final words, comments? Uh, two things occur to me. Uh, first of all, the people who espouse repli replacement theory really don't have that much to worry about. Yeah. One of the things that, that I try to do with teaching identity issues with my Asian American students is that our groups are not sacrosanct and our groups have all the flaws that other groups have as well. We're just as corrupt, just as liable to extortion, just as evil uh, as anybody else. And so when we share in power positions, uh, things that if all, if that's all that is that changes, that the faces at the table and uh, pulling the levers of power, uh, include all of us. Uh, the society won't change very much, mm -hmm. a little. I think that idea of being inclusion. inclusion yeah, so like, they don't have anything yeah. particularly to yeah. worry about, but about the yeah. nature of society. The second is um, in terms of where we wanna go and how to get there, uh, I'm not sure, um, I have my own ideas on where we wanna go and they may be uh, um, not acceptable to a lot of people. But I, I do think that one thing that is that, that would be universally uh, received is people should learn, uh, should actually learn left brain side. I, yeah. I do believe affective right brain side is yes. important. But we're, we're um, uniquely positioned to be able to provide 
uh, histories, interpretations, and so on. And, and this can happen in a lot of different ways. And, the, and the young people really need this, and, and as well as uh, immigrant parents or grandparents. I mean, I think older folks are uh, able to learn. And I, I, I do hope we don't give up on them. Good. You know, uh, Gary, it is always such a pleasure <laughs> to be with you and talk about different things. And I leave you with the final word, too. Well, I, I, I really appreciated those words from King Yi and from Franklin and from Rivellen, a, a beautiful thought. I'm just going to quickly say that, uh, you know, we, we have uh, really, uh, when it comes down to it, we have, uh, we're talking about uh, a, a future of our nation. And, uh, you know, do we envision the nation as being more beautiful and more uh, meaningful and more uh, loving because of uh, a variety and differences that can be respected? Or do we envision uh, a homogenization? And uh, 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 just, and I mean this in the most broad, broad sense possible. So uh, I, I'm, I'm a partisan for the former and not the latter. And I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this uh, beyond the Jewish community. And uh, I wanna conclude by wishing all those who are still with us, uh, either a very happy last day of Jewish American Heritage Month or Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And I wanna thank Ted and the 1882 Foundation and my co-panelists uh, for uh, this wonderful tradition. Let's make it a tradition, you know, uh, in Judaism, uh, that's a, a big thing. Uh, we we uh, we're always uh, uh, want to transform things into a tradition. So let's make this a tradition for this special month where we can always find uh, good things to talk about and make our world a better place. Thank you, Ted, so much for being such a, a gracious moderator. I want to thank all of you guys for participating and some people at the very last minute. <laughs> Thank you very much, both to Dr. Pearl, Dr. Zola, Dr. Odo, and also not quite Dr. Dr. Oi, but we'll call you that. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And I also want to thank in the background, Lisa Frank, uh, Lisa uh, Franco for uh, being our host, uh, technical person to watch out for us. And Wei is always, always there in the background, helping to make sure that uh, I don't stumble somewhere and I get stuck in some technical loop loop somewhere. So I want to thank all of you guys for that. I also want to thank again the program sponsors that we have. Uh, Chinese American Museum of Washington, D.C. just open. Go over there, take a look. We also have uh, OCA, uh, the uh, D.C. chapter, and uh, we also have Panda Express who help us support some of our programs. So thank you all for going here, coming here, and all the audience for participating. Uh, stay tuned to 1882 Foundation. We have monthly events, which we call public, uh, which we call talk stories or timeless echoes, in which we take on topics on this type of forum. And uh, next one that might be a particular interest to other people. Uh, there'll be a couple, a few things coming up in July. One of them is that we're going to be talking with film producers of uh, three Chinese American film producers who, who produce separate, separate, separate documentaries on Chinese Americans growing up in Jim Crow South and what that all means. We'll have an African American moderator, and we're trying to do up a program in which uh, our topics are not just siloed, but also draw in other uh, groups of people to talk about these important topics. Other things that are coming up, particularly Gary will be very interested in, <laughs> is that we're going to try to revive a talk story and how to play Mahjong, and we're going to have both Jewish and Chinese together. And we're hopeful also that uh, Wei is particularly excited because she says, let's do a supper club, and let's do a supper club on Christmas night. Right, so that oh, we can that's have idea. the community. That, that's yeah, yeah. There's, there's a couple of books written about that. So. <laughs> exactly right. Then we can have a lamp, fries, things like that. So anyway, take a take a look at our 1882foundation.org and uh, 
uh, follow us if you uh, care to, which we hope you do. And again, thank you, thank you all so much for being a fine audience and attentive audience and some very fantastic questions, which I wish we had more time to explore. Join us, we'll try to do that again later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Take good care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, it's a pleasure.